Tony Crane of the Mersey Beats. Hello. Welcome Hello. back to the yeah. stage of the cavern. Fantastic, isn't it? You even know who we are now. There he is. <laughs> <laughs> there he is. Yeah. Well, very year? young, very young on that. Do you know, how many years ago is that, roughly? That was probably a while. 65, I think. So well, well, 50 years, ah, 50 oh, years. Yeah. Goodness. Taking you back even further... Can you describe the Liverpool of your childhood? Because you grew up, you, you're a real central Liverpool boy, aren't you? Yeah, well, I was born in Liverpool 1, uh, which is off Park Lane in a tenement. Hmm. And at 2A St James's Gardens was my famous address. And then, which was wonderful for my parents because they lived in a court, uh, what they call, where it just had one toilet in the middle of the court for all these families to use, one tap in the middle of the road. So moving to these tenement blocks was like luxury for them. It was fantastic. Three bedrooms, proper bathroom. Everything was wonderful. But I didn't know any different, you see, because I was born there. But they were saying how fabulous it was. But I couldn't figure out how we fitted in because um, I got six sisters and two brothers. So there was nine of us, plus my mum and dad, all in three bedrooms. I thought, that's a bit of a squeeze, wasn't it, when you think of it now? But I never thought at the time. But that was great, and then we moved down further, nearer to the cavern, I would say, further down Park Lane, and lived in, in a, a flat. Um, but what I didn't realise was at the time was because of where we lived, that's where all the imported records were coming in, because we're right by the ports, right by the docks. And I started finding out, my family were saying, well, just bought these records, listen to that. Well, it was not played on the radio, it wasn't played anywhere else, uh, it wasn't on television. And he, I said, when did you get that? Oh, you have to go to this place called Nems in town. And all these imported records were coming in uh, from the little stations and little... Uh, fr from America. And uh, that was my first introduction to all these unusual records that were coming in, you know, because they weren't sold nationally. So, oh, there we are. Well, you've kind of answered the question I was going to ask. <laughs> what, you know, what was the kind of first experiences of music entering your life? But it sounds like it was from the docks and those, those imported records. Well, it was, and it was... What um, grabbed you? Which sounds grabbed well, you at that time? It, mm. You'd be surprised. The first person that grabbed me was uh, Mario Lanza. As a kid, I couldn't believe the sound of this guy's voice. It was the most incredible voice I'd ever heard. Then I went on from him and to people like Johnny Ray was coming mm. out. I was still a little tiny kid then, but loved all this music. And I'd stand in the middle of the floor at parties and <laughs> get down on one knee, you know, like Johnny Ray did, and, and sing and everything. And uh, I loved it then, but of course everything changed when my sisters took me to the local cinema and took me to see Love Me Tender. Mm. And at the time, I was playing in the church band. I was an altar boy. I was playing trumpet in the, the church band. And I saw Elvis, like a lot of people did. <laughs> you saw him and your life just changed. Then I want to be like him. He's the one. All the girls were screaming every time it went on. And I thought, why are you screaming? What's this? You know. I thought, I'll have some of that. I wouldn't mind that. And uh, anyway, that was it. The trumpet was put to one side. I begged my parents to buy me a guitar taught myself how to play, and that's all I wanted to do then, but I was too young to do anything about it. Mm. So um, I plodded along, sort of going to school and uh, practicing the guitar and singing in front of the mirror, and everything that's what we did. And that was it, right up till I left school, and then I left school early, I left school at 15, and um, went to the Royal Ivor Friendly Society, an insurance clerk. Very good job it was, very really good, but all as I was doing is dreaming every night about drawing guitars and things, saying this is what I want to do. And then eventually, we, um, I told a friend of mine in the work, I said, I'm, I'm looking for somebody to start a group with. Um, do I call bands then? It was always a group. Mm. And um, he said, well, I know a guy, but he's still at school. He said, but he can sing just like Buddy Holly, and he can sing just like Billy Fury. And he's okay. And I thought, well, there's no clash there, is there? Because I wanted to sing like Elvis or Cliff Richard or people like that. And he said, this sounds good, this. So we met up, Billy and I met up, 
This is Billy Kinsley. Billy Kinsley, yeah. yeah. Billy and I met up. We had a meeting at my house, and um, we sat round playing guitars and singing different things. And I realised then there's no clash here. Mm. His, his voice was different to mine, higher than mine, and everything was okay. How old were the two of you at this point? Uh, well, Billy was still at school, so he was 14. Oh, really? Oh. And I was just nearly 16. So. Were you aware of? A music scene in Liverpool, outside of the records and Elvis coming from the States, were you aware there was a scene bubbling Well, I don't here? think Billy was, but I told Billy that I'd been to see a band, and I think the first band, uh, the group I ever saw in Liverpool was Farron's Flamingos. It was Farron and the TTs, I think they mm. were called at that mm. time, very early. Quite a performance. Saw them at the David Lewis uh, yeah. Theatre, which is up near where I lived. And I couldn't believe it. Yeah. All the girls were going screaming at him, and he was dancing all over the stage. He going, can dance. I like to this day, yeah. <laughs> I thought he's doing what, like you know, what I thought he only did in America, you know. So I thought, wow, this is good. What well, sort of band now? But then when I formed uh, the Mavericks, we were called. When I formed them with Billy, I thought we were unique. I thought we'll be the only group that has two lead singers. And then we changed and brought um, Williams in on guitar. So we had three lead singers and we thought we're the only band. So we're completely, completely unique until I saw the Beatles there. Mm -hmm. but, and I still remember to this day, I came down to see Dale Roberts and the Jaywalkers to the cavern because I, I believe that they sounded like Cliff Richard and Shadows, identical to them. I'll come and see you, see what they're like. And as I stood up to go out, the Beatles were getting ready to come on. I wasn't interested in seeing them at the time, but I couldn't move because all the crowd came in the archways. And, and, and I'm thinking, God, what's this? I'm going to have to sit and watch the Beatles now. You know? But I still remember to this day, it was the most unbelievable feeling I'd ever had. Really? Seeing anyone. I couldn't believe it. Why? See, at the time, well, at the time, Paul was only playing what they call a Lucky Seven guitar with like three strings on it. Because it was not wasn't plugged in anyway, so it didn't really matter. Um, and he had to do Sutcliffe on bass at the time, and he'd come forward and sing just one song, which was "Love Me Tender." So yeah. I was impressed with that. Yeah. That was good, you know. But I just couldn't believe how a group. I thought, here's another group with three lead singers. Yeah. I thought it was only us. Yeah. And then I thought, no, they've got four because Pete Best used to sing a song <laughs> as well. But I still remember, it, it, it touched me so much seeing them on that night. It was like, they were so different to everybody else and they picked songs that I'd never heard. No. And I thought, where are they finding these songs from? No. And then I found out after talking to them later, they were doing the same thing. They were going to NEMS and finding out what new records had been imported. And they were finding all these unusual songs because they weren't doing any of their own at the time. So uh, that changed my life then again. So I thought, wow, that's the way to go. It's the way to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, what were your memories of your first gig that you played, Tony? Was that with the Mersey Beats or, or was that no, the same still, guys? No, it was still the it Mavericks. Mavericks? So, yeah, we, we did the Rankin Boys Club, which is up near where Billy, Billy Kinsley lived. And uh, we did that. And it was a bit of a shock, really. I remember it was... We tried to look moody on stage, so the lights weren't very good. So I remember we had a bulb plugged in, and we painted the bulb red. And of course, halfway through the first song, all the smoke came everywhere. So we had to run off the stage while they cleared all the smoke, because everything just it melted. And that was it, so uh, that was funny, but it was good. It was good, you know, we, we, we got it, the first gig done. Then we started doing YMCA's and things like that. Because we weren't, we didn't think we were big enough to play at these venues around right. around Liverpool. Because the cavern, of course, was just a jazz club at the time. I mean, the jazz bands were top of the bill. It was only sort of the Beatles that come on a few shows, and then uh, Swinging Blue Jeans uh, spelt like uh, the other Gene. way, mm. like Gene Vincent thing. And um, but. They, they came back, and then even when I came down and saw the Swing and Blue Jeans one night, they were sort of half jazz band. Mm. They had a banjo, and they had the upright bass, and they did all these type of songs. And uh, it, it's a funny thing that when, um, 
when the Beatles were on Jukebox Jury, something stuck out to me. They played I Think of You on it, to all the Beatles, they were the full panel on it. And they were playing all these records, and they played um, Hippie Hippie Shake, which the Beatles used to open up with. Yeah. They didn't know that some of the Blue Jeans had gone in and recorded it, were bringing it out as a single. And I remember John Lennon jumped up and said, where's the banjo? What's up to the banjo? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was it. Because then when they played, the last record they played was I Think of You, which um, which they all stood up. So they haven't got much time to comment on this, but they all jumped up in the air and said, they're all mates, they're great. Uh, That'll be a great hit. So which helped us at the time, yeah. because I Think of You would come out in the December, was only sort of the bottom end of the charts, and as soon as the Beatles gave us their thumbs up for it, I think it went in the top ten the next week, uh. Italy, and stayed there for a long time. So you were the Mavericks. Um, <laughs> I'm guessing that might have a Western connection. Well, yeah. yes, when you think about it, we're talking about 1961 mm -hmm. here, when we decided to call ourselves the Mavericks. We did that purely because the most popular TV show on television was Maverick. It had James Garner in it and Roger Moore, and all the, the fabulous program, and it was so popular. So we thought, we'll call ourselves that, because we loved the way they dressed. We loved the, the idea that it was the most popular TV show, so we thought we'll get noticed by calling ourselves this. And we immediately uh, went to a tailor and with photographs of the guys and says, can you make those suits like that, you know, Western suits? Uh, he said, well, I'll do my best. So we did it really. Oh, we had to adapt, like tails. We had to adapt them, cut them short and make it like a long jacket. And uh, so we dressed like them, and then we got known for being quite smart on stage, uh, dressing like nobody else had dressed. Because at the time, of course, when I finally saw the Beatles, they were still jeans and leather jacket and black t-shirts and things like that. So we were a bit different, and we didn't want to dress like Cliff Richard in Shadows. Didn't want to do that, but we thought this is our unique style. Here. Yeah. And then that fashion went on to as soon as we had the hit record. Um, it's a bit really counts in 63 and we went and had different suits made then because we were called the Mersey Beats then you see and there's a story there about the name we were happily called the Mavericks flying playing all around Liverpool and one night we did I think it was the Entry Institute and Bob Waller was there the books to Kevin and uh, he saw us play and he said oh, I think you're absolutely fabulous he said you're a bit young but I'd like it to become resident on the cavern besides the Beatles, uh, with the Beatles. I said, well, I know the Beatles are resident there now. He said, why do you want us there? He said, well, you know, there's a lot of lunchtime sessions to do, lots of evening sessions to do, so you won't have much time to play anywhere else if you agree to do that. So I said, well, I'll have a think about it. He said, but I don't like your name. I said, the name's fabulous. What's wrong with it? He said, well, imagine you're going to see a country and western group. Mm. So he said, I'll think of a new name for you. Okay. He said, and I'll launch you this big show, and top of the bill will be this new band with your new name. And um, I waited for the Liverpool Echo to come out that week. And I waited, went and got it, and I opened it like that, and I went, oh no, he hasn't put us on. Because I saw all these names, like Rory Stone and the Hurricanes, and you know, Down in the Scenes, and all these big name bands. And top of the bill, this great new find from Liverpool, the Mersey Beats. And I thought he hasn't put us on. So I ran all the way down to the cabin, confronted him. You promised you'd put us on. Why haven't you put yourself? I haven't put you on. I said, no, just some name of a paper. That's all. <laughs> you know, and he went, no, that's your new name. And I went, oh, no. I said, you may have called us the Daily Mails or the Liverpool Echoes or something. Mm. Didn't like her at first, no. really. Because obviously the music wasn't called that in those days. It wasn't yeah. even called the Mercy yeah. Sound. Um, so I, I sat back and thought, I said, well, okay, then we'll go along with it. So we did that show, and then the second show we did as the Mercy Beats, we were on the cabin here with the Beatles. Mm. And John Lennon said in the dressing room, he said, I don't know, I like a new name. Mm. I said, do you? He said, oh, how did you think of that? And I just thought, oh, it's no problem. I just thought of it, you know. <laughs> but he gave us the blessing to the name, and I thought, well, if he says it's okay, it must be okay. Excellent. Mm -hmm. What about Bill Harry? Did he have a problem? Well, it's no. Uh, what, apparently what had happened is uh, Bob Waller went and had a meeting with Bill Harry, mm -hmm. 
so they want to uh, call this, change the name of this band to the Mercy Beach. Yeah. Do you have any objections yeah. to it? And what he said, he said, I was seeing the Mavericks. He said, they're really good. Yeah. I won't mind them using the name mm. at all. Fabulous. Cool. So if it would have been somebody he didn't like, he yeah. probably would have said, yeah, yeah. can't use it. So he gave us the blessing as well for the name. Well, how did working with Brian Epstein come about? Well, Brian Epstein was uh, was a strange one because we were we were actually playing on the cavern when he saw us as well. He'd, he'd already signed the Beatles, but he used to frequently come down to the cavern to see who was on, to see anything else. He saw us one day and he wanted a meeting with us and we signed up with Brian Epstein. He said, I'm about to launch the Beatles on the world market and make them big stars and everything else. He said, and the next one I want to do is the Mercy Beats. He said, I'm going to do that. So we said, okay, yeah, so we signed up, everything was fine. And then he took the Beatles to a recording session and they did the first one for Parlophone and then he got the first record out and he bought them all shiny new suits for the television and everything else. This was pre the Bolero things, the, sorry, the, what are they called? The, mm -hmm. the Italian yeah. things with the round collars. Um, and he bought them suits and then he bought them for the next television. He bought them another set of suits and I kept like, up saying to him, when are you going to buy us suits? Sounds stupid now, but when are you going to buy us suits? He said, there's plenty of time, you'll have to wait another few months as I'm busy with the Beatles at the moment. He said, well, when are you going to get us a recording card? Oh. Uh, so anyway, we, we walked out and left them. Really? really with them for a few months. Ah. <laughs> we said, we're going to go somewhere else and try and get a recording contract. But didn't, didn't you work with them again later on in the band's career? We did, yes. He was about to sign us again. Um, we did, I think it was the year before he died, he, um, well, I think it was the year he died. We, we did a tour as the Merseys um, with the Four Tops right. and um, he put us on again. He said, you know, if this is silly, you need to be back at the top of the charts again. Because we'd had a hit with Sorrow, we didn't have much after that. Um, and he wanted to take us under his wing. We just left Kurt Lambert and Chris Stan who were the Who's managers, but they were managing us, but we were a bit saying that they were taking too much time living in America and all this. So so Brian said he'd look after us and launch us again. On the he said, I've got some great songs by John and Paul. He said, I'm sure the songs would be perfect for you. Right. He said, and they'd be delighted, John and Paul would be delighted if we record some of their songs. So we did this big tour and we were planning the future then back with Brian, everything else, and then of course Brian died then. Mm -hmm. So it was like, that was such a shock, you know, like, oh no, we're just about to make it again, you know, because he had everything lined up. Mm -hmm. I mean, because we'd been round um, a lot to Abbey Road, because John Lennon loved Sorrow that much. He kept bringing up and saying, when you're in town, come round to the, watch us record. He said, and we'll discuss a song because he said I want to produce the follow up to Sorrow mm, right. and um, he said I'll think of a song so we used to go around to Abbey Road and we'd sit around or playing guitars and singing different songs that he'd already recorded but doing them a different way and we decided on a song called I'll Be Back um, No If You Break yeah. My Heart that one, that's what we were going to do and he'd arranged it completely different to suit my voice and Billy's voice and uh, we got it all ready and we said, oh, we'll have to do it next week. So we can't do it at the moment because we've got to get this TV show out the way. And that's when I realised how good a lyricist John Lennon was because we were around there, um, all sitting around in a circle. They'd already done the backing track for this track and Paul was up in, in the box up the stairs with George Martin mixing the backing track. And he kept putting his head out the door. He said, John, have you written any lyrics for this song yet? He said, we're going on live television all around the world in two days. Mm -hmm. John said, I've got plenty of time to do that. Because he decided it was all he needed his love. Uh -huh. And John had decided he's going to write the lyrics. And Paul was arranging all the back backing mm -hmm. and everything. And that was what I realised. Because when I saw the show there on the Friday, we got invited to it. We couldn't go because we were playing in Blackpool at the time. And um, when I saw it, I could see John Lennon with these little pieces of paper stuck to the microphone. He must have only just written the yeah. lyrics before yeah. they went on live. But I was thinking, write lyrics like that so good mm -hmm. in 10 minutes yeah. or something. Yeah. Yeah, that was marvellous.
Because George samples um, a line from... He uh, did. Yeah. Well, he tell was, us about that? He was, mad, that he was mad as sorrow as well. They all were. They all mm. said that if... The biggest compliment we got, they said, if the Beatles would have recorded that song, sorrow, they couldn't have done it any different. They said they would have done it exactly the same. And I thought, wow, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, that's a nice compliment, that. So they loved it that much, and George loved it. He just absolutely... Because when we were going, John was going to do the follow-up to Sorrow, produce it. Um, when we were sitting around playing, George says, can I play guitar on it? Could, the band's going need a guitarist. And I went, okay then. And then Ringo said, can I play drums on it as well? You know? So that would have been nice, wouldn't mm -hmm. it? <laughs> and then that all fell apart because um, we went back and told Kit Lambert, I said, John Lennon wants to produce it. He said, you can't do that. He said, I'm your record producer. Yeah. I said, well, just bring him in just for this one uh -huh. record. So they said, do you all want to play on it as well? No, I can't do that, no. I want you to do a Pete Townsend song, because he had the publisher for Pete Townsend. Yeah, so of course. That's one we did, So Sad About Us, mm. which we got given So Sad About Us on a demo by Pete Townsend, and he'd done all the backing himself, and it sounded fabulous. Mm. I thought, right. And Pete Townsend said, so just put your voices, so I'll take his voices off put mine and Billy's on and do the harmonies and it would have been a great record but of course Kit Lambert had different ideas he said no I see it with a full orchestra and two drummers and timpani drums and, and all strings and all that sort of thing. so it lost the atmosphere then we recorded it that way uh, needless to say it wasn't really big I think it got in the top 40 that was about it mm. Have you re-recorded this at all? No, we've, we've done it occasionally on stage, yeah. but we try and do the version that we should have recorded. Yeah. Uh, but that yeah. would have been nice because they were actually thinking of releasing it. Well, Paper Townsend wanted to do the Merseys with the Who. They actually wanted to put that on the label, you know. So uh, that would have been nice. It's sort of different to do, you know. So Tony, you, you kind of mentioned a few bands there, like the Beatles and other people that kind of stood out to you. Were there any other bands around at that time that were kind of favourites of yours? Well, you know, uh, I think the best band around at the time was obviously the Big Three. They were just the most amazing band I'd ever seen, well, group at the time. And I remember one night I came down to the cabin. Uh, we were on the next night, or I'll come down the night before. And they did a spot on the cabin, and they never said one word. And, and mm -hmm. they never waited for any claps at the end of the songs. As they finished the song, they went, what, two, three, four, went straight into the next one. And I'd never seen anyone do that before. So they did a full 45 minute spot like that. And I thought that was amazing. And fab every song was fabulous, you know. Mm -hmm. And that was when I first noticed how good Johnny Gustafsson was. You know, when I saw them, and I thought, God bless us. He'll never join the Mersey Beats. He's too good, you know. <laughs> I've looked up to him quite a bit, you know. So the big three is a name that, that often crops up amongst the um, players like yourself from around that time and um, shame that there's not a lot to listen to of them from that time. I think it was more the other the other bands, the peers I would say, looked up to them more so than the actual fans and the people who came down to see them. Right. Because they weren't sort of, I'd call a girl sort of band for Scream, although Johnny Gustafson was probably the one of the best looking guys to come around to Liverpool <laughs> at the time. But they didn't act like that. Johnny Hutch was sitting right in the front on the drums and the others were sort of behind a bit. So they didn't sort of appeal to the girls and everything. But the other bands did. I mean, when I first saw Jerry and the Pacemakers down here, I was a bit surprised with them because everyone else was playing rhythm and blues, rock and roll. And Jerry, what I thought was going to go into cabaret clubs, because the type of act he was, he was very good. But I think because they had a piano. Mm. Uh, and everything else, their songs sounded a bit more cabaretish. I thought. A lot of longevity to them and everything, which has proved it now. But um, they were, I was a bit surprised when I saw them, and they, but they were very popular. They were very popular at the cabin, whenever they played. So the Big Three were kind of more like a musician band? Yes, I, th I think that's what it was with the Big Three. Everybody liked the Big Three, all the bands, everyone liked them. And you looked up to them and wow, they're good. Yeah. So how did it come about that Johnny Gus then played with the Mersey Beats for, for a short while? Well, that happened when, uh, I think it was the end of 63, early 64, we just recorded I Think of You. And then um, Billy, for some reason, wanted to leave. I think he wanted to get married and settle down and, uh, and everything else. I'm not sure where it was really, but anyway, just uh, 
he left. And it was funny because Billy had walked out one week and we were just about to do a tour with Dusty Springfield and Manfred Mann, a theatre tour. And we couldn't get a replacement that quickly. So we did this tour as a three piece. And I played bass guitar. Vernon <laughs> Williams played guitar and John Banks on the drums. But we got away with it. We did it, still did all the hits. We did everything that we'd had. And, um, and then we, en we ended up doing Top of the Pops uh, four times, four weeks on the road. And each time we did it, we had a different bass player because they'd, they'd signed up for us to do it as a four piece. Yeah. So we couldn't do that as three people. So we had we were trying different people out to see if they suited the band. One was uh, Terry Sylvester from uh, who ended up nice. from Escort to join the Hollies, and we had different people trying them out. Nothing seemed to work, and then um, it was suggested to us the best bass player and the best singer around was John Gustafsson. I think he's not going to join the band. So he's the big three. They're fabulous, you know. But he said, "Oh, I believe he's not doing too well at the moment. He's stuck in some." dingy little club in the middle of Germany and he's doing a residency there and they're there for like the next three months or something. And I said okay then, so I spoke to our manager said let's jump on the plane and go over to Germany. So we arrived in Germany, didn't know where he was playing, it took us about two days to find out where he was and went and had a meeting with him downstairs and he said oh no, he said you're out that band now, the men's I said yeah. I said one of our lads has just left and uh, what do you consider joining? He said, why? <laughs> I went, oh, what do you mean, why? I said, no, we need a bass player and you're the best. You're the one I've always looked up to. Would you consider doing it? He said, that ah, depends. He said, what are you doing? So I sort of said to him, well, this was the Tuesday. I said, Thursday, we've got to do Top of the Pops. I said, on the Thursday night, we're playing in somewhere in uh, Bristol. I said, and then the Friday we're playing somewhere else on a tour, doing a theatre in Newcastle. I said, and then the Saturday we're doing the double. And that's why we call it the double, because that's where the name came from. All the bands that were busy at the time, when you'd bump into another band on the TV show or something, you'd say, how are you doing? How often are you playing? Well, we're doing eight days a week. <laughs> that's where the name came from because obviously the Beatles were clever enough to put it into a song <laughs> because you always did a double on the Saturday if you if you played uh, Birmingham, London uh, any of the big cities mm. you always did two venues on the Saturday mm. so you ended up doing eight shows in a week so that's where it came from oh but then, anyway uh, he had to think about it and the next morning he said I'll sleep on it overnight and the next morning we went back to our hotel and came to he was there with his bags packed he said, have you got me a flight? <laughs> uh, oh, okay, yeah. I said, what are the band doing? He said, they've got to stand there, it's okay. So the, the rest of them stayed there and got someone else to stand in. The German guy. So we flew back and we went straight to a gig without any rehearsal at all. Arrived in the afternoon and he just went straight on stage and he'd been listening with his headphones to some songs, you know, that he did. And it was perfect. Went down, absolutely. So immediately we clicked. Right That's away. Great. So I was delighted with that. that. That worked out really well. And that was the time in 64 when we did, with Johnny Gustafson in the band, we seemed to be at our height because we'd had another two hit records, Don't Turn Around, uh, Wishing and Hoping. And um, we got offered a trip to go to Italy. And no one had had a hit in Italy, only us. We were the first Liverpool band to have a hit in Italy, you see. Probably because of the Latin American feel to I think of it, I'm not sure what it was. So we arrived, didn't know anything about it, said you've got to be in Italy for three weeks, so uh, touring around and everything. But when we arrived in Italy, all these people met us at the airport and, and everything. Oh, this is fantastic, there's limousines to go around in and all that. So we did a couple of gigs and we said, oh no, next week it's all doing your TV show. What do you mean? I don't know anything about this. So we filmed about six TV shows, 20 minute slots. Mm -hmm. He said they're going to show them every week as a series of shows, just the Mersey Beats, nobody else, just doing all these songs. And so we went, did that, did the tour, came back to England, and within a couple of weeks they were on the phone again. Can you come back over and film the spectacular? Because the, the show's being that good, but popular. They wanted us to do hour long 
bi-monthly it was, every two months we did an hour long spectacular show. What did, what did that involve? I mean was it just the set on stage or was it more, was it backstage, was it behind the scenes? No, it, well, well the, 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 the 20 minute slots we had, we just set up as a mm. band and we played. Mm. We played for 20 minutes, didn't have to announce anything, we, but when we did the spectacular ones, it was funny because we were set up on a big set with all dancers and everything else and they asked me to announce each song that I was going to do. So I'd say this next song is such a song and then this Italian guy would walk and stand right in front of me and say it's a boy I'd just said in Italian. Huh. So when we'd count it in, no one could do anything for laughing then. It was, it was just amazing that that happened. But that was a really successful time for us. And we also did America at the same time. Right. We did a tour of the States. How was America? First time in America, yeah. Liverpool boys? It wasn't that. It was, um, it? It was a bit of a, 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 I call it a dirty trick. Ah. We had Management? A, no, really. It was the record company. Ah. And I couldn't believe it. We had the big hit here with uh, Wishing and Helping. And it was played to us first. It was going to be on an album by um, Dion Work, um, but Bert Bacharach had heard our version of A Slug That Really Counts, mm. and he suggested that we do a version of Wishing and Helping, because he'd written it and he loved the way we did A Slug That Really Counts. And he said, um, they sent it over, and the a and brought us in, sat us down and said, um, have a listen to this song, Bert Bacharach would really like you to do it. And, oh God, that's good. You know? mm. So we heard it in the morning, we booked a, um, a rehearsal room for the afternoon and then we came back in in the evening and recorded it. So that was Wishing and Helping. So it went straight in the chart, big hit. So he said, what we're going to do, we're going to launch you in America on Wishing and Helping because we know it will go down great there because of their back rack and everything else. So they booked the tour for us to do. We did something like 32 television shows and about 50 radio shows. Promotional tour all around, really, New York, Boston, Chicago, all around that time. And um, but when we arrived at the airport, all the cameras were there, and we had the furry shirts on, and everything. They, were, they were delighted. They interviewed us and everything. And then when we got to the first, right away the schedule was unbelievable, because we got off the plane, and within an hour we were in the recording studio, film studio, doing the TV thing. And he said, what song are you doing? I said, wishing and hoping. They went, oh, that's already in the charts by Dusty Springfish. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how did that happen? Yeah. So what we found out later is because it was a hit, the two a and R man, one was our, ours was Jack Baberstock, who worked for Fontana Records. The other one, I think, was John, I'm not sure if it was John Friends. But anyway, he worked for Phillips. They were, were against each other all the time, so you could have the biggest hit. And when he saw Wishing and Hoping being a big hit here, he brought Dusty Springfield in, recorded it, and got it out in America before mm. us. Mm. It never came out in this country, it only ever came out in America. But it was already in the charts while we were trying to promote it. Mm. So we had to quickly go to our back catalogue and launch it up different songs that didn't quite happen there mm. for us. It was a bit of a shame because they spent an awful lot of money. Yeah, it was great when we did the Bear Backrack show because. Um, Bert Backrack particularly wanted us to do Wishing and Hope and Ori. And because Dusty had had the hit in America, he worked out this way where we did. I, we, we sang the verses and she sang the middle ages, and then we sang the verse, she sang the middle ages. But it seemed to work. Mm. You know, it, it's very popular now. People get it on YouTube. Yeah. And it's, um, it, that's how it came about. And he, he's such a nice guy. I mean, he was, uh, still is now. He's still going, isn't he? You know, writing popular songs and everything. But he was, he was good. We, all, we always loved the lyricist, uh, Hal David, uh, because I thought the back rack songs, Hal David didn't get as much no, you know, mm -hmm. notoriety as him. Mm -hmm. But um, I thought the lyrics were fantastic and every one of the songs were good. You mentioned the Frilly Shirts, yeah. and the Mersey Beats were known, particularly in teen girl magazines like Jackie, I think, as being um, a step above most other <laughs> scruffs. Um, who was the fashion guru in the band? Because it was quite unique looks that you came up with from, I think you mentioned the Bolero style uh, well, Toreador look. Well, yes, I, um, I, on the father's side, I'm Spanish anyway. Yeah. Um, yes, and on the mother's side, it's Irish. 
So I've always loved the Spanish dancers and the, the Toreadors and the way they the way they dress. So we immediately, as soon as we had the first hit record as the measurements, we got the Blair jackets and, and the straight in the trousers and the striped down the side and everything else. But we noticed that they were wearing furry shirts as well. So we thought we're gonna get skittered at for this. So we had some furry shirts made. And we did get skittered at a bit at first, but then it all changed, it all changed. People thought, wow, that's the thing. And then we started advertising in um, the Money to Maker and the New Muscle Express adverts saying, this is where you buy the Mersey Beach for the shirts. So they advertised them and we used to sell them a lot then. Yeah, so they used yeah. to keep sending us these free shirts. And everything. So we stopped wearing the jackets and just wore the shirts. Made the popular ones were yellow. There's, there's famous photographs of us in the middle page of the Jackie magazine where we've all got yellow furry shirts on and everyone seems to like that. Even now. Mm. It's great. But, you know, it's all part of the time. It was good, you know, it was fabulous to do that. To be accepted, we thought we'd be skittered at so much. Mm. Mm. We're, in, we're, we're in Seinfeld, we call it the puffy shirt. The, the pirate shirt, yeah. <laughs> I think it's a good looking shirt, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But then I suppose if there was any time to do that, it was the 60s, I suppose, mm. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, of course, that was it. Well, you could get away with almost anything then, but we didn't like the idea of being sort of scruffy or anything. We liked to be really dressed well. We used to get voted the best dressed mm. band uh, on this, in the UK quite a lot. And um, so we we used to shop all the time in Carnaby Street every time we had days off because we virtually lived in London at the time because that's where everything was happening. And um, so we always had the best suits on, the best ties and the best things and everything with the little frilly shirts as well. So we're actually thinking of going back to wearing the frilly shirts on the next tour we do. We're doing a, yeah. we're doing a great big tour again, a solid sort of 60s tour next spring. Um, we're looking forward to that. So When's that kick off? It kicks off on, in April. It's the um, UK or uh, yeah, beyond? Yeah, purely the yeah. UK. Ah. It's not Northern Ireland this time or Jersey, which it normally is, but it isn't. It's just uh, England, Scotland and Wales. And it's playing actually in Liverpool at the Philharmonic on the 27th of April. Right. So we're looking forward to that. Excellent. But so before that, here on the stage of the cabin. Yeah. In a couple yes. of days' time. We're on here, yes, uh, on the 18th of September, and it's, uh, we're looking forward to that because we only do it once a year. We do an anniversary show. We first did it in uh, 2012 because we realised it was 50 years since we did our first show at the cabin. And I came up with, um, I looked up my old diaries that I still had somewhere, and I found the set list, what we did on our first ever show at the cabin. So that's what we do. You're recreating that? We're recreating Fantastic. that. Same. We, we do two spots. So the first spot will be, we'll be dressed all in black, like, you know, with the leather and everything. And um, we'll do that first spot. Then we have, a, we have a break. And then the second spot we call, as the major beats are now. We have, like, nice. fluffy white pirate shirts and different things. And doing all the songs. Well, that Excellent. was a question. You know, a lot, a lot of those guys and um, bands, musicians, carried on playing, just carried on going, you know, didn't stop anywhere in the 60s, like, like some of the books say, you know, and, and how do you view that today? You mean, the Mersey scene, if you will, today? Well, the Mersey scene um, is great at the moment. I don't have much chance to see any new bands that are coming out, but there's so many bands still happen. It's just changed a bit because um, the only places for them to play places where you've got to put your own show on and sort of sell your own tickets right. things like that so it's a bit weird I mean the cabin's great for um, putting new bands on but they don't often do it because they really just have Beatle bands on all the time you know um, but it's it's a bit hard I think for them to get the break now right. it's mainly because of X Factor and things like that you know I mean X Factor is okay because the um, Fio uh, Leona Lewis and um, a couple of people, it's worth it just mm. for them, I think, you know. Uh, Jennifer Hudson, I mean, she came about fourth in the American one, and she's like one of the best singers I've ever heard in my life, you know, so those two are probably just mm. okay yeah, for that. But anyway, but the scene at the moment, I'd like to see more of it, to be honest. I'd like to see what's going on. 
we don't really get the chance of seeing people. Right. But you're still playing the gigs and you're working, so I suppose. Well, wait, that's the reason you know? why I'm just yeah. so busy all the time. We're touring everywhere, you know, and we we still go abroad quite a lot. We do. Um, we still do. Uh, in fact, this last six months we've been to Finland twice, uh, Sweden, um, Germany, um, Spain twice. We still play in those places. We haven't done America. We were going to do America last autumn. But uh, we couldn't get the visas in time mm. to do the British Invasion tour. Oh. That would have been a good one. Yeah. But we just, it's terrible getting visas now. You, know, yeah. so you have to wait for an appointment for, to get <laughs> interviewed and why do you want to go there? Yeah. And so but outside of that, the beat goes on. Right well, it certainly year. does with us because uh, we haven't stopped. We're booked up till the end of 2016. You know. Amazing. And we're discussing things for 2017 now, so another tour. Did you think when you were sitting in the uh, Liver building <laughs> um, that all these years later no, we you'd didn't. be sitting on stage at the camp? Even <laughs> when we were having our hit records, going back to probably 64 or something else, like 18, like going on 19 then, mm. we spoke about what would you think we'd be doing when we're 40. Because yeah. 40 was like, whoa. Brian Epstein, can I take you back to Brian? Any specific memories of the man? Well, it was strange because um, when we first met Brian, uh, we knew him, obviously, the Beatles introduced us to him. And um, I thought it was strange about what he got to do with music. You know, didn't know anything about him. We'd been to Downs quite a few mm. times, but didn't realise it was Brian Epstein's shop. He was running it because he looked so out of place. He'd come down the cabin with these immaculate suits on and, <laughs> and everything else, his hair very short and trimmed, and of course, how was he going to do anything for the Beatles? Uh, but then when we got to know him, obviously he was in awe of what was happening down the cabin. He was in awe of all the acts. He just loved the, the way they all lived and the way they did it. He, 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 he liked the way all the bands took everything with a pinch of salt. They weren't bothered if they were late. He didn't like that idea, but if they were late for a gig, he didn't think that was right, he needed to do it. But it just showed that the bands didn't really care that much. They just wanted to get on stage and play mm -hmm. and do the bit. And all. But other than that, we went to a lot of parties with him afterwards when we left him. Um, every time the Beatles had something out, we'd get invited round, because we, we ended up watching a lot of Sgt. Pepper being made Billy and I used to go and bite the ground to the studio, you know, to Abbey Road, and we'd sit around drinking tea, and they'd be smoking their heads off, and um, recording these songs. And then, of course, when the album came out, that was it, Brian Epstein had a big party in his house, and everyone was there, and, you know, it was all great. It was good fun. Smashing person, lovely man, greatly missed. Tony Crane? Huh. Thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful memories. Nice talking to you. Nice talking to you too. <laughs> and you're great. So sorry. Yeah. Forgot to plug. Yeah. The song Let's um, Black Swan. Yeah. Well, there's like two singles out. And one of them's just being picked up in LA of all places. Remember this, and we'll sorry. do this, and then we'll sorry, quickly no, do that. Because okay. no, that can be dropped into what you're doing next year. And, and course, also, yeah. my son has even entered the business. Blah blah blah. Yeah. Good. Well, he plays with me when Rob's he can. Shot, he Sorry? Play. Rob's in shot. Yeah. I like him in shot. <laughs> so, right. just other questions. Okay. Whenever you're ready. Great. Just give me questions. Can you describe the Liverpool of your childhood? What's your first memories of music entering your life? <laughs> no, that's great. <laughs> just feel so, that, you know, so formal. No, that's okay. Right. How did you become aware that there was a music scene on Merseyside? What are your memories of? Can you remember your first gig? Was one you did? That's I right. Remember. What were your memories of your first hey, gig? Can I just wait a couple of seconds? Yeah. Yeah. Because it feels just weird looking at Tony after this. Sorry, don't look away. <laughs> what are your memories of your first gig? The Mavericks. I suspect there's a Western influence in that title, that name for your band. You mentioned a few bands there, um, you know, a couple of names that you mentioned, who had stood out to you, like the Beatles, etc. 
Do the highlights for you on the scene at that time. Thank you. And also, what kind of reaction did your first room kid get? Did I ask that question? Did you? Yeah. I don't think I did, did I? Did you? I think you did. Oh. I see. I think you did. What kind of reaction did your first gig get? Uh, can you tell me more about Brian Epstein? Do any stories come to mind? These days, music seems to be thriving across Liverpool. So, where do you see. Mm. How do you view the Nazi scene today? That's what it was, wasn't it? These days, music seems to be thriving across Liverpool and it's pretty busy and a lot of bands playing gigs. How do you view the Nazi scene today? You've mentioned the Frilly Shirts. Um, the band was known for its sartorial elegance. Um, who was the fashion guru within the band? That was it from me, I think. Yeah, I think that's, that's it. We, we're just going to, if you could clutter. I believe your son has followed you into the business. So it's the next generation. Well, yes, uh, as you asked me before about the, the music scene around Merseyside at the moment, uh, I've forgotten to mention that my son uh, uh, followed me into the business. He started off as a classically trained pianist, um, and I said, no, you need to get in the band, you need to form a group and get going, which he did. And when he has time, he actually plays with the Mersey Beats now as well. Uh, he's playing at the cavern with us, playing keyboard and guitar. And if I want him to, we can play the bass, and if I want him to, we can play the drums. And I keep telling him, no one likes a smart eye, you know. <laughs> he can play anything, you know. But anyway, he, um, he's got his own band, and they're called Black Swans, and they've had two singles out recently. And uh, the last single was picked up by a radio station in Los Angeles. Fantastic. So they're bringing that out on a compilation album. How would you describe the sound? Um, is it following in father's footsteps or? It, when people hear it, they say it's, it sounds a bit 60s, obviously, because of his influences. But I think it's what I call um, clever pop, a bit like what Queen would do. Mm. You know, nice, so good songs, but really they're basically just rock and roll. Mm. But, you know, you sit down and try and play them, and oh, this is a bit hard mm. to play, you know. So his classical influence have come out in the songs because he writes the songs as well, you so. see. And, uh, but that's good. So I'll be carrying on next year uh, producing a new album because I have my own recording studio. So we'll be doing a new album for Black Swans um, for next year. And then we carry on then touring. Uh, we've got this massive tour coming out in the spring. And in between, we're doing loads of other things as well. So we're keeping busy.